Thanks for the introduction and welcome and thanks for all of you to be here. Um, today we will talk a little bit about how to get into career, whatever that means. We will see. Um, my name is Philip Singer and my colleague Dimitri Gordiev. We will do the presentation together so we will switch halfway through. Um, we would like to do this more interactively so if you have any kinds of questions please just raise your hand or shout it, whatever, and we can talk about it because it makes the whole thing a bit more easy going and we can discuss things directly. Um, we will talk about our journey on Kaggle and in the end also go a bit more into detail about what our suggestions would be for you to get into Kaggle if you want to. Um, we will try to keep the methodolog methodological stuff a bit more high level and if you want to know any details we can go into, into more detail so please just ask. Um, so who are we? Um, my name is Philip, um, and actually both of us, that's how we know each other, work as data scientists at Unica Insurance Group. Um, I'm from Graz, I studied uh, computer science in Graz, did a PhD in computer science at Tiel Graz. Um, I have quite a long history now of doing uh, machine learning research, statistical research, data science research. Um, was long time on at university and now for two and a half years I work at Unica. <coughs> um, both of us are quite highly ranked on Kaggle, just as an introduction to give you also some credibility of what we are trying to say. Um, so I'm ranked 36 and Dimit is uh, ranked 34. And he will be yeah, 34th as of today morning, it can change any day. Um, <laughs> my name is Dimitri, I'm originally from Russia, I moved to Vienna six uh, years ago. First I joined Raiffeisen. Uh, and like two years ago I moved to Unica um, and I was doing uh, credit scoring mainly most of the time and then I moved to Unica and I decided to do more data science related things. I have a master's degree in data mining back in Moscow, um, yeah, and so I'm focusing on Kaggle lately, but yeah, you will, you will see. And um, both of us, that's why we do this presentation together, have been competing on Kaggle for now nearly exactly one year. And we use our team pseudonym, <coughs> our team name is the Zoo. Um, that's what, what we chose uh, before, because all of our machines at, uh, at work well called after animals, so we were searching for a name, that's why we are called the Zoo, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so, just to give you a quick introduction for those that don't know what Kaggle is. Um, what is Kaggle? Kaggle calls themselves your home for data science. So it's basically similar to the Vienna Data Science Group, to the meetups, it's basically a community where people can meet, talk about data science and do all things related to data science. So it's an online community of data scientists and machine learners. It was originally founded already in 2010, where the field was not that well known yet and not that many people were in it but it was acquired by Google in 2017 and uh, it belongs to Google now and it's quite big as we will also see it based on some numbers. Mm -hmm. It is probably most well known for data science competitions which is the thing we will most fo mostly focus on today. But as I said, it's also a very large community so there is the opportunity to share notebooks there, to share codes, there is a lot of discussion going on you can share data sets, you can, you can do all those things. And they also have their own courses, their own tutorials. So even if you don't want to compete, there is a lot of stuff to do there and a lot of knowledge to be gained. Also what not many people know is that they have a full functioning free <laughs> notebook infrastructure with CPUs and GPUs. So if any one of you has ever, have ever used the, like Google Colab or something like that, it's very similar but sometimes even the infrastructure is a bit better there and you can, can use um, a lot of compute power for free. Um, so how big is Kaggle? Kaggle is probably the most popular machine learning competition platform. Um, originally, they, they kind of invented competitive data science, if you want to say it like that. Um, if you ever have, have heard about the Netflix challenge, all those things kind of emerged around that time. And um, nowadays, a lot, of, a lot of companies, which we will talk about in a few slides, hosting competitions there. Not all the competitions happen on Kaggle, there are also plat other platforms, but Kaggle is by far the largest one. It has 125,000 users, 
Um, over, over all those um, 10 years or so, nine years, um, there have been 350 completed competitions. And they have around at least 2,000, up to 10,000 users per competitions, or even teams. Yeah? So quite a lot of people who compete in these competitions. There is also sometimes, or mostly, some prize fund for competitions. Uh, like the top spots get some kind of price, it's in the range usually of 20,000 to 100,000. So, Kaggle also yearly does some kind of surveys about their audience, so just to get a bit of feeling of what people are on the platform. Um, of course, biased by who replies to the service, but it gives you a quite a nice overview. So, um, most of the people are between, let's say, 22 years to like 39, so kind of um, in, in, in what I would suspect most of the people who are here in the room. Mm -hmm. um, kind of where are people from? You can see that there is a very clear bias to people coming from India, actually, um, from the US, also partly from Russia um, and Western Europe. Um, in the survey, you can see that around 50 person from Austria uh, replied, so not too many, but there are some actually also other really good data scientists from Austria who are competing. Um, but yeah, clear bias towards India and US, and also a lot of Russian people there. Um, actually, people are quite highly educated, I would say, on Kaggle. So you can see that at least 50% of the respondents to this survey uh, have a master's degree, 20% bachelor's degree, even close to 20% a doctoral degree. Um, yeah. <coughs> also, when it comes to data science, it's often kind of a competition between different types of programming, programming languages, usually Python or R. Um, you can see here how the, how the um, people responded to the question, which programming language do you use on a regular basis? Um, mostly Python. Both, also quite a few, quite a lot of people only are, um, only in this case, 834, and neither, interestingly, uh, 6,000. So probably they use neither of those um, um, languages, maybe they use SAS or uh, those related um, things. But the question was on a regular basis, so maybe in the job they use different types, and that's why they replied to that. Um, but interesting is what programming language should an aspiring data scientist learn first, and here, clearly, Python wins by a large margin. So that was just to give you a little bit of um, introduction to what Kaggle is and how the people uh, look like and what, what they do on Kaggle. Um, let's get back to what we want to talk about, which is competitions. Um, so competitions on Kaggle are usually hosted either by companies or research institutes. So for example, Bank Austria could now say, look, we have an interesting data science project, an interesting problem to model, Let's forget about GDPR and everything. We want to outsource that. Um, let's take this data, prepare it in a way, find a nice prediction task, think about a proper metric, and then talk with Kelly and host this competition. And then up to 10,000 data scientists try to solve this problem in the best way possible. So in the end, and then the price money is maybe 50,000 or whatever. So it's for companies actually ignoring what they need to pay to, to Kaggle for hosting the competition. It's a very cheap and efficient way to quickly find really good solutions to some of the problems and basically outsource them to a lot of different data scientists and in the end even have the luxury to pick the best solutions. Um, but there are also sometimes research institutes who are like eager to explore what is possible in the research area and then try to host competitions. Um, the main goal usually is some kind of prediction task that's it's definitely is tailored around machine learning, so it's usually some kind of prediction task. But there are very, a, a wide range of different types of competitions. So what is really interesting is that you can get in touch with different types of domains. Um, I think, I would expect most of us um, work in some kind of financial um, area, but you can get into touch with medical, medical um, topics, you can get in touch with sports topics, you can get in touch with like all the computer vision stuff. Um, so there is a lot of different types of domains you can get in touch there. 
and you can focus on different types of data. So for example, one com competition might be more focusing on tabular, classic tabular data. Another might focus on text data, NLP, or image data, videos, time series. So all the different types of data that are um, that you can think of, there has usually been some kind of uh, competition for it. Different types of objectives like classification, regression, image segmentation, and different goals of competitions like you have these featured competitions, which usually have some prize money, but you can also have some research, also playground, which is just for you to play around. There is a leaderboard, but there is like no competition pressure, actually, in terms of like who has the best solution in the end, but it's just a ranking for some playground data. Or in class, which are the competitions that are hosted together with some courses that carry those. Um, of course, as in all online platforms, they have a kind of progression and progression systems for people to also um, expose what they have been doing um, with medals and ranks, we would get to that. And as I said before, top spots usually receive some prize money. So people who compete on Kaggle compete not only for the prize money because only top three teams usually get it, but rather for points and uh, competition medals. So there is usually like in normal sports, you can get the gold medal, a silver medal, or a bronze medal. And it depends how many people in the competition get those types of uh, medals. Um, how it depends on how many people participate in the challenge. So for example, um, with 1,000 plus teams, um, the gold medal, the top 10 get it, plus 0.2% of the participants. So you can think of 15 maybe or something like that. And usually nowadays most of the competitions are in this area with 1,000 plus teams. And then top 5% get silver and top 10% get bronze. And you also get some ranking points. And then your profile can look like this, um, where you have your points for the competitions. In this case, this awesome data scientist got three gold medals, three silver medals, one bronze medals. And then there is some kind of current rank, what was his highest rank, and so forth. But it's not only for competitions, it's also for kernels. Kernels are basically notebooks that you share. So you can share, you have, so you write some tutorial in a Jupyter notebook, you share it there, people upvote it, you can get medals for that, or in a competition. And also for discussion, um, you, can, you can post a nice guide about something, you can even post a meme, yeah? but you can get discussion points here and um, you can, you can um, progress here. Um, if you have a certain number of gold medals, silver medals, or bronze medals, you can get in a different tier. You can get a master, in the end even a grandmaster, and you can also get those ranks for discussion, for kernels, for competitions, and not on the slide, nowadays, uh, a few weeks ago, they also have a fourth category about data sets. So if you publish data sets there, that others can use, you can also get points. So how do competitions usually work? Um, like in all classic machine learning tasks, focusing here on a classic supervised example, which is the most common task in, in the competitions, you start with some um, label data. So what we know from working companies that it takes a lot of time to prepare the data until you get to the task. This is most, mostly not what you need to do on the platform. So you will kind of start with already in at least some form nicely prepared data that you can start with. It is labeled, you have a clear task, and you just need to start from there. So for example, if you think about some competitions, which would be some, for example, fraud detection, you would have tabular data and the labels for the tabular data, which what is fraud, what is not fraud. Um, and then you have um, unlabeled data, and usually it is split into what they call public test data and private test data. So during the competition rounds, you train the model with the labeled data you have locally or on the platform and you predict the public test data, which is unlabeled data, and that's what you see on the leaderboard, how your score is during the competition. And at the end of the competition, there is also private test data that you usually or sometimes don't even see at all before the competition ends, and 
your whole model is rescored on the private test data and that defines the final ranking of the competition. So during competition, you have the label data with the features, with the labels. You train the model with the label data. You predict the unlabeled data and then also the, the private test data for public and private test data. During the competition, you know how well is your model doing on this public test data. And at the end of the competition, you see how it fares on the private test data. And sometimes it can happen that people who are on top here kind of shuffle down here. Because usually this data here is larger, and sometimes people really overfit to this public test data. So that's a very important concept, um, usually in competitions on okay. But think about this data being something if you put a model into production and then you test it on future data. So now I want to talk, or both of us want to talk a little bit about our journey through the platform, which began around one year ago. As I said, we usually, the team name that we use is the zoo. Um, I think it was 27th, I checked it, uh, November last year that we started. Um, Dimi had one competition that he did before, so that's how he got me a bit into it. Um, but we had little prior experience on Kaggle. Um, why did we start with Kaggle? Uh, we have a lot of tasks at work where sometimes, as I said, it can be hard to get the data, to, to really explore what you can do. And what we do at Unica partly is also to work, for example, a lot with text data. And um, in this sense, we wanted to learn more about working with text data. So all these new techniques that are out there, and specifically the last one, two, three years, a lot, I'm sure you guys know, um, a lot has happened in NLP, and we wanted to just use some kind of data, learn about it, learn about the new methods. And there was a nice, nice competition, which I will mention uh, in, in the next slides, that we just started with. So we started to learn. Um, since then, we participated in seven competitions, and our strategy has always been to diversify the types of competitions for learning purposes. I mentioned before, they're like very different domains, very different types of data, and for us it was always important to kind of tackle new, new things where we can learn stuff and where we can explore stuff and get in touch with state-of-the-art methodology that we can then also utilize either at work or, or um, in other environments. Um, as you can see here, we did pretty well um, in those seven competitions that we have competed in. Uh, we started with four, I will talk about that, but we also did a few other competitions. We will talk now, I think, about four. Um, as I said before, we will not go like super into detail, so if you have any questions or want to know more, please let us know. Um, we started out with a uh, Quora competition. Uh, Quora is a question answering platform that is probably more popular in the US, um, where people can ask questions and then someone replies. Very basic question answering platform. And they wanted to have a model that identifies if a question is sincere or insincere. We will have examples for that in a second. They had 1.3 million labeled questions. Out of those, 6.2% insincere questions, and overall 4,000 teams participated. Um, binary prediction task, so basically just predict is the question um, sincere or insincere, and evaluation was F1 score in that case. What was also interesting in, in that competition is that sometimes they have so-called kernel competitions, where you have to develop and predict the model in their notebook environment. And in this case, you only the whole script was only able to run for two hours. So that means, in this case, it was, for example, not possible to upload any externally trained models. You had to fully do it from scratch, basically on the platform, within two hours, but with GPUs. So what is a sincere and insincere question? These are actual examples. 
So the first question is how can I become a data scientist? That was hand labor, yeah, that was mostly hand labor data, was a sincere question that would be allowed on the platform. But then other questions like how come Trump is so stupid would be an insincere question. Uh, is it possible for a vegan who does CrossFit to go 10 minutes without telling someone about it? <laughs> yeah? So you can see really, really weird questions that are happening there. Every time I slap myself in the face, it hurts. How can I prevent this? Would be also an insincere question. So a lot of fun reading those questions, and they have been mostly hand-labored. And basically, the task of the model was to classify those exactly into those two categories. So get the question, model should say sincere or insincere. Um, as I said, um, we were not able to do any model training outside this environment. Um, at that point in time, it was already starting to become popular to use BERT or to use um, some more, um, more recent state-of-the-art methodologies for these kind of NLP tasks. But we found a way to still model it in a very nice way um, with, um, with neural networks, of, of course. If you, if you do um, NLP classification nowadays, it's, it's mostly, mostly about neural networks. And that was specifically what, what we wanted to learn in this competition, because before we were mostly using like bag of words, classic, classic stuff for text classification. Um, but in this specifically this short type of text, uh, neural networks really shine. Um, not going too much into detail here, but basically it was um, an LSTM model. LSTM is a recurrent neural network structure that uh, people still use a lot for, for uh, these kind of NLP tasks. Um, the model in the end is, is quite, quite simple, so you have the text input, you have the word embeddings, we use Glove and Paragram, those are pre-trained um, word embeddings. Then we use LSTM, and we also had separately some statistical features, like the length of the text, um, uh, number of special characters, and, and, and similar things. Um, if you have questions, please ask, but that was a very, in the end, quite, quite straightforward um, LSTM model. Of course, you need to tune this a lot. Yeah? So even if I say now this is simple, this coming up with this structure needs a lot of experimenting and a lot of iterations. So you probably start with something very simple, taking the cloud vectors, taking a, an LSTM or even a, a convolution neural network, um, do some pooling, and then you're here. Those are the very simple steps in those kind of networks. But then to come up with all the tuning, how to choose the optimizer, that is very experimental, and it's mostly trial and error. Um, and to our surprise, um, to our surprise, we won this competition, um, which was really because we had barely any, any experience before it, and we competed basically for learning, but then we got hooked, of course, because in the public leaderboard we were also already somewhere here in the top, you can see here, this is the final private leaderboard uh, score, so we were three spots below in the, in the public one. And, um, yeah, so quite a success to us. Um, we got addicted to kegging. Um, yeah. um, the next competition is, we, we try to cover now four com competitions with <laughs> different, different types. This was an NLP competition. Um, the next we did is was for Santander. Is a large yes. Who is the third one? We were free. Yes, uh, this was also a colleague from us uh, at work. <laughs> How can you make sure that you are not overfitting on the public test data? Um, yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, usually, you try to find a really solid cross validation setup. Um, so you you should try to not overfit too much on public data, me, um, public leaderboard, meaning choosing the final model, because in the end you have to, like here you can see, oh, you, you, you can't see, you can see later, you usually have like 200 submits during the competition, and then in the end you need to choose two out of those 200 models, which you think will be the best one for the private leaderboard. 
So you have to make a really solid uh, decision making in the end. It's similar to thinking about which model would you choose if you could put this into production. Um, usually those people who choose it just based on how it fares on the, on the public leaderboard lose spots because that's basically bias towards the public leaderboard. So it's better to choose something that is very robust in your cross-validation setup. So you have your training data and there you do some cross-validation. How you do the cross-validation is very dependent on what, what type of competition you're doing. And usually you try to find a cross-validation setup that has a good correlation to the public leaderboard. Okay, so next competition was Santander, a large bank. And they wanted to us to identify which customers will make a specific transaction in the future. So you and and here we had 200,000 transactions. Actually, this is I think to date still the largest competition on Kaggle. 8,800 teams participated, and the whole duration of the competition was two months. Why did so many people compete here? Because it was classic tabular data. It was not too large data, and it was very weird data. <laughs> um, so it was very mysterious data. So in this case, we did not know at all what the data means. So you can think of a table with features and you have no understanding of what the features mean. They were completely obfuscated, um, probably anonymized. Um, we still don't know to this date what exactly the data was supposed to be. But think about, you just have a target column, you have like, I think in this case it was uh, 200 feature columns, and you need to predict the target column. And, coming to the solution, all the features were 100% uncorrelated. So you had like 200 features, and each of those features was completely uncorrelated to any other. So as soon as you chose any kind of model, that models some kind of correlation, like let's say a decision tree with some, some dependencies between the features, you completely lost, yeah? So um, in this case, which was from a modeling perspective, something completely new because you have that very, very rarely. I've never seen that and probably will never see it again, but it led us to also explore some other techniques. Um, in the end, what was best was to model each of those 200 features separately and then multiply the predictions, or take the sum of the log, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, what kind of models did we use? We explored here really a lot. Um, the classic things, of course, gradient boosted machines, neural networks, but also that classic logistic regression, KDE is even a density estimator, knife pairs, splines, um, so more like classical statistical methods, and all of them worked very similar, and so we used more of those, and what people on, 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 on Kaggle usually in order to win, you need to blend more, more different types of models together. So, for example, you have one GBM model and one neural network, and in the end you average the predictions of both models, and that's usually, usually better than just picking any of those, specifically in tabular data. Um, in a nutshell here, it was weird, weird data, and maybe the main message here is, generally on Kaggle, you can win a competition if you know gradient boosted machines and neural networks. Those two things are usually enough. Um, nowadays, gradient boosted machines are not sufficient to know to win a tabular competition because, as I said, also neural networks start to shine nowadays more on tabular competitions. Um, but as soon as it's NLP or, or, or images, it's usually only neural networks. Um, this competition, um, we ended in seventh place. Um, you see us here only dropping two places. Um, the green spot would have gotten some prize money. You don't get rich here usually, but it's a little bit. Um, and we dropped after the leaderboard two spots. It was kind of also um, interesting to us because here we teamed with uh, one of the top Kegels. He's now rank three or so, very long time uh, rank one um, Kegel. So what we also try to do is to team up with other persons 
to learn how they work, basically, which is also a great learning experience if you observe how other people think and other people work in order to learn how to do stuff. It was a bit frustrating, we should not be frustrated because we got seventh here, but we were like, for the, for the whole time of the competition, we were nearly uh, always on first spot. And only in the last one or two weeks, people caught up to us. Mostly because we found this trick with the different variables quite early. And then someone couldn't found it himself, couldn't make sense of it, posted it to the discussion forums. And of course, all good people can wait, make of those hints quite quickly a uh, sense. And um, yeah. But in the, in the end, here you can see something which is sometimes <coughs> common is like this is a Aurox score, and you can see us. Basically, we have here the same score, it's just a different digit here, and to the, to the top it's less than 001, yeah? So sometimes, in some competitions, you have like really, those are maybe unimportant um, differences, but in the end, that's what, what matters. Uh, excuse me? So, is how many times you submitted the run? This year? Yeah. Yes, um, you can usually enter each day two to five models, depends on the competition. And um, that's just the final number of models. And out of those 125, we had to choose two in the end, which were used for our uh, final scoring. And out of those two, then the best one is picked automatically. Was it hard to find your uh, third uh, colleague? This one here? Yeah. Um, actually, in this case, well, OK, it's an interesting story. So we. We started to contact him because we thought, wow, this guy is super, super good. We want, we want to try it. We want one competition. Maybe he's interested. Yeah. Um, that's what that was when we were lower here on the leaderboard. Yeah. And he didn't reply. But then we we jumped and suddenly he replied, Yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. That's how it works. Um, because those guys have quite a reputation already, and a lot of people ask them to join the team because they expect them to help them a lot. Um, and um, in the end, we, we had a really good team. We learned a lot from him. Um, I'm always happy to team up with him again. And it was, it was really a great experience. And um, if you ever have the chance to, to team up with, with such people, it's, it's, it's very valuable. And as I said before, not many people appreciate uh, teaming up with others because it's, it's, it's really valuable to learn. Mm -hmm. I would like to know, for example, uh, as you said, the results are very close. Uh, do mm -hmm. they uh, do any like uh, any a statistical test to see if they are like significantly different to each other? Or you could, you could. There are even, even some people saying this is completely uh, irrelevant because if you would do a signi uh, statistical significance test here, it would be uh, not 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 significant. It's a fair point, but um, in the end. This is what matters. Yeah, you you can you need some kind of final scoring, and um, still going from here to here. Yeah, if you read their solution and ours, they did something better. So it's definitely, it's definitely um, um, how shall I say, uh, justified that they are here and we are here. So uh, sometimes it's of course just some luck. Yeah, have a different random seat and. You are here, have a different random seat, and you are here. Um, usually, people always say afterwards, oh, if I would have chosen this submission, I would be here, if I would have chosen. But that's what you need to decide on in the end. And it's also very important to kind of reduce this randomness by bagging more models together, um, dif use different seats in your solutions. So, um, yeah. How do you guys communicate in such a setting? So do you have calls or through notebooks? We have Slack and that's basically where we, where we communicate. Um, Eva is from uh, Brazil actually, so we have different time zones. This can actually be also helpful because you can split your time a bit. But usually it's just texting over Slack the whole time. Once the challenges are completed, are the data sets and the approaches of the different teams published? Um, usually the people can decide themselves if they want to describe their solution and their, their model. Only a few competitions don't allow it, where the host says, I want no one to publish the solutions, I want to have them for myself, but that's like one out of 100 maybe. 
and usually the top teams describe the solutions afterwards. And um, some even post the notebooks. That was, yeah. And um, this is, we will, we will come to that a bit, but this is where a lot of learning can happen if you read up afterwards what other people have done. And of course, you also try to figure out what have they done, which we didn't do, um, in, order, in order to, to um, learn. Um, okay, then I will hand over to Timmy, who will continue with the next two competitions. Okay, thank you. Um, this was like two out of the seven competitions we took part in. I will continue with two more. Um, and as Philip mentioned, what we focused on was to diversify, to try something we haven't tried before. And uh, the first competition uh, he described was textual data, and we were like really interested in how it works, what can we do. This one was more like a classical tabular data. And next one was what was up there back then on Kegel, um, a competition hosted by Los Alamos National Labor Laboratory, which, um, as far as I know, was responsible for Manhattan Project, so they were develop developing nuclear weapons back in the days. Um, now part of their work, at least, is um, research related to earthquakes. And this is, um, this uh, particular competition was about uh, machine learning application to predicting when an earthquake is going to happen. But of course, they want to generate data, so if they started with so-called uh, laboratory earthquakes. Um, I will dive in a little bit more on the next slide, just a few words about the competition itself, um, because um, at the first glance it looks really impressive, because they, they produce 600 million data points about the, the simulated earthquakes, which were split in 4,000 training segments. So basically, you're not going to you're going to be predicting uh, the earthquake based on like the, the past 4,000 points reported. Uh, there were like four and a half thousand teams. A relatively big competition. First, because it's physics, and there are a lot of uh, Kegelers with physics background. Second, it's research, which is always appealing. And third, it was again quite easy to jump in because. Even the data looks uh, too big to handle. In the end, actually, what we came to conclusion, or our conclusion was actually, we would like to have more data for such competitions. This is too little. And uh, the final model actually, I think, took 30 minutes to fit and predict. It was not limited uh, time-wise, but uh, just whatever we did was pretty light and fast. Now about the laboratory earthquakes, uh, stuff I learned myself basically this summer. Uh, what they do is um, they have a laboratory uh, where they uh, have uh, two pieces of rock, they glue it together, they put it into a machine which puts pressure from both sides, and they put a lot of acoustic um, detectors around the, the rock, and they basically uh, measure the acoustic signal. So that's, that's as simple as that. So. Um, as soon as they apply more pressure, the more particles within, in between the rocks um, uh, break, and we can hear it on the acoustic signal. So what they were doing is they were like applying pressure through some time, recording the signal. This is how the data looked like. Basically, that's what we had, just, just some acoustics over there. And at certain points, uh, Kind of the uh, the thing that glues the two rocks together it breaks and this is what they report as a laboratory earthquake. So that's some of the uh, plots they had from their research papers. So basically, we see that there was some signal at first when they started applying pressure. It was uh, quite random, but then there were some uh, particular pieces of of the acoustic signal which can identify that uh, this particular. Uh, case uh, is getting close to an earthquake, so they're close to uh, actual breaking. The green spot over here probably describes something what we call segments. So what we had is just this piece of information that uh, that part of the experiment to predict when this thing is going to happen, and this like sudden drop indicates that there was an earthquake. Of course, we've never seen such data before, so we got interested and we jumped into it. Um, with regards to what we did, um, 
what uh, we try to do is like look at the time series, look at the acoustic data, let's generate tons of variables. Uh, there were people on the contest which I think similar generated terabytes of data out of it. So thousands, if not tens of thousands of variables. We ended up using four variables. Um, and uh, we used a combination of crazy and boosting trees and neural networks, so basically the two methods which worked, but in the end it was sufficient just to do uh, another, uh, one, of, one of those two. So just LightGBA model was sufficient to basically win this competition. Yeah, we learned a lot. We learned a lot how people treat uh, time series, how people do uh, some uh, fancy transformations of the acoustic signals and stuff. Um, and we did a couple of uh, tricky things, I would say, which helped us to go back to the top. Um, that's um, a very interesting picture to look at because if you uh, look at this column, the second one, you would see that on the public leaderboard we were at place 355, but we ended up at the top. Um, this is not because of the variations of the model. Uh, this is not because we picked up the most robust models and the others didn't. This is because the public training data and the private part, which one, uh, which was used for the final assessment, they were different. They were quite different. Eventually, they supplied only a very short part of the experiment for the public part and quite a longer one for the private. So the public was not really indicative of how well you're doing with, uh, with your model, but the private was. So um, it was a little bit different experience because we had to kind of give up on our attempts to climb the public leaderboard. So we just uh, crossed our fingers, slipped in our CV, and hoped for the best. That worked out quite well. Um, you can also see that we had quite a large team. We, we had like eight people in the team. We, uh, we teamed up with a bunch of people from Germany, from states, from Korea. There was one, one guy from Greece as well. Uh, that was one of the reasons, uh, the, like the, the frustration of not being, um, uh, not getting higher on the leaderboard by creating a better model kind of caused us to maybe seek for more minds to jump in to think about it. So that kept our motivation up during the competition. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we did it. Uh, funny story that Los Alamos Laboratory had to publish a press release as the result uh, after the competition finished. That came, uh, uh, Austrian Association picked it up and we, yeah, what's that? Alpha picked it up. Anyway, we ended up in the newspapers and some of the local ones, which I think automatically just pick up all the new news headlines. So. I think our name is mentioned in some four Eidenberg paper as well. That's another achievement. Okay. Um, so, so, so you knew that the data was different, like the, the private data would be different, but you didn't know exactly how it would be involved. We knew it's uh, it's too small and a little bit different. Okay. So what so we did, okay. yeah, what we did is we kind of just focused on. Um, what we did was uh, we dropped part of the training data, which I've never done, neither before nor after that. We uh, just took the training data we had, we took the, uh, the, the signal of the private part, and we just dropped whatever seemed like not belonging to there. So we're focused on, the, on those earthquakes which, uh, which were similar to the earthquakes we're going to predict. And we trained our model only on those. So we physically dropped, I think, like 20% of the data, uh, picked four most reliable variables, ran the basic model, and we won. Uh, unlike many people who spend like weeks trying to fit uh, fancy LSTM models to, 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 to that problem, or generate tons of different variables and stuff like this. Um, and this is probably the part where, should be, where we should be proud because we tend to find simple solutions. We tend to like disregard the competitions where you have to like build a monster around that to win. 
So we always look for something simpler. Uh, in this case, it was quite tricky, to be honest. So my personal conclusion, there is no like, unfortunately, there is no magical feature which would allow you to predict the next earthquake accurate. But probably it's also a valuable conclusion for, for the sponsors and for the organizers. Uh, so uh, the guys you team up with are were they more like data scientists or uh, earthquake earthquake experts? And um, uh, how, and also how did you decide which uh, so four of the best parameters? How do you decide on that by expertise or by some uh, I know PCA or something that uh, derives uh, like the best features? Um, good question. Um, First of all, teaming up, uh, none of them were physicists per se. Uh, some of them had experience with time series, so we learned a little bit from them because some of them used some fancy libraries to do some transform signal transformation. Um, so it was not like focused on the domain expertise, and I'll talk about, about that a little bit more. So um, th these were like data scientists. Uh, mainly, and with regards to how we picked the variables, uh, basically what we noticed like mm, Whatever, uh, if we try to, to complicate things, it doesn't pay off. Well, let's try to simplify things. So if we drop most of the variables, is it performing as well as it does? And it does. And we ended up with like just four variables which do the work basically. And um, we, based, uh, we based our assessment of what is, val uh, what is important and what is not just on those four variables. So basically, did a lot of like plotting charts and stuff, how they behave, whether they're stable, whether they are, wh whether they behave okay, you know, training data and, and test data as well. So we did a lot of those. And then just like by rerunning the same model over and over again with less variables, we just came up with those four which did all of it. But to add, to add here, this was a competition where we had the private data uh, in our hands. And we didn't know the targets, of course, yeah, but not in all competitions you have the private data. So what you naturally do here is you look at least how the features look like in the private data. Yeah? Just a simple distribution of, of the features and you check, oh, shit, uh, the distribution of, in the test data looks completely different in the training data. And then you start thinking, why can that be the case? What can you do with it? Uh, and so forth. Um, Kelly tries to generally move a bit away from these type of competitions where you have the private data. It's not always possible because here you fit your model externally, you need to predict this a CSV file with, with, with the final predictions and upload it more towards kernel competitions where you not always see it at all beforehand. <coughs> okay, now I'm going to jump to the fourth one. Um, at this point, and that was, I think, around August, so like four months ago, we were thinking about uh, jumping to the large topic we have never touched before, which is working with the image data. So uh, we picked a competition, which is, was called Aptos Blindness Detection. Aptos is uh, a, a, an organization, a medical research organization, I believe. And we focused our efforts on learning what is up to date with the uh, deep learning eventually for image recognition um, and put a lot of efforts about like learning how, how it works, what, uh, what is important and how to deal with that. But first, a few words about the competition and the topic. Um, diabetic retin retinopathy was the topic, uh, which is uh, a disease and uh, uh, main, main leader of the blindness uh, in the world, basically, and in this competition, we're supposed to uh, diagnose diabetic retinopathy based on uh, retina images of Indian population mostly. So this this was was focusing on India uh, because for them it's important in rural areas to uh, to detect this disease early because this is very treatable if you detect retinopathy quite early. And they have lack of um, apparently they have lack of uh, qualified doctors to do a, a diagnostics properly. So they were checking whether you know, a model can do that basically. So you supply just the, the pictures of the retina, which is I guess relatively easy to produce, and the model is supposed to identify 
whether you have it, and if you do, what is the level. And uh, there is an international scale from uh, kind of f with five levels. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and you were supposed to basically feed the model which would predict do you, uh, does this patient have diabetical retin padding? And if he does or she does, then what's the level? We had quite limited data, three and, a, uh, three and a half thousand images, but we were evaluated on like 15,000 images. Uh, both sets were manually labeled, labeled by several doctors, I, I believe. So data was relatively reliable. And there were 3,000 teams in this competition. Um, these are the types of the pictures uh, we were looking at for a month, I think. Um, I learned quite a lot about this disease. I have, I knew nothing about it before the competition started. I didn't even know it existed. Um, basically, what we're looking at is uh, um, you go to an eye doctor, they give you dro uh, drops, which, uh, and then take a picture of the retina, which is the back of your eye. Uh, and you see on those pictures, you see kind of the structure, the blood vessels, uh, and maybe some uh, uh, something going on there. Uh, this is an example from one of the kind of research papers uh, to like have at least basic understanding of what we're looking at. Basically, uh, uh, diabetes uh, causes uh, small blood vessels to. Uh, um, Damage, damages blood, uh, blood vessels and causes the damage to the nerves in the eye. And uh, as soon as, uh, when someone has a diabetes, the blood vessels in the eye are very sensitive. It's very risky uh, for, di uh, for people uh, having di diabetes to actually have problems with the retina uh, at some point. So um, if you see a healthy eye, basically this is how it looks like. You see there's just the blood vessels. Uh, this is um, this is optical disc. Yes, uh, I know the terms now. Um, this one looks fine, but as soon as you see some spots over here, that might indicate some damage done to the nerves. If you see some larger spots, you can uh, probably this is blood over here, so there is like nerves died out over here. And whenever it's uh, you, you see scars on the images and like large uh, pools of blood over here, this is some severe case. That's the background, um, and what did we do? Um, first and most important was for us to do a lot of pre-processing uh, because there were different devices making pictures. Some of them looked a little bit bluish, other ones looked a little bit greenish, so we tried to put it together. Uh, to do a lot of pre-processing, uh, take some ideas from similar competitions from the past and stuff like this. Uh, so we did a lot of work around that. Um, and then we, of course, played around with the neural networks. So we discovered what's out there, what's important. What we could do in this case is just take the pre-trained model, train on the data we have, fine-tune on the data we have, and then, uh, and then run the predictions, which was, which, which was important. Um, finally, we were using EfficientNet, which came out, I think, two or one month before the competition, so there are a lot of people not even aware of that, but this is a kind of a cool thing about Kaggle, that you basically take whatever is out there, whatever, whatever is best. Um, yeah, that was a lot of work and a lot of like GPU uh, costs burned, and we ended up ninth. So in all four competitions we're talking about today, we ended up in top 10. We also teamed up with a couple of people from uh, US, uh, and yeah, that was our, our experience with image competitions, basically. Not much movement over here, but you can see that we moved up 15 places, that means that we are, by, by, by that point we had a good experience of how to pick up the final models. Um, yeah. Any questions about this one? This one is quite like standard. Yeah, please. For example, start a competition. Do you prefer looking at other public journals or do you think you get biased and it's better to just try yourself? Good question. Um, 
I usually just jump into the data, try to like look at it, try to understand what is what is about. But it's always the case that we we'll look up the previous solutions. So whatever worked best either on this on similar competition or competitions from the similar domain. We don't look that much at, at like public kernels at this competition. Maybe just like briefly browse through that, but try to like not to get biased and like do whatever everyone else is doing eventually. Uh, but it's yeah, it's it's a it's a good question. We don't we try not to focus on the public uh, public kernels at, of this particular competition. What about the discussion? You follow the discussion that. Uh... Yes, yes, you have to follow the discussions because, and that's what happened with Santander, basically uh, it is frequent that someone figures out something interesting about the problem or the data, and the person probably is not able to um, use it for his own benefit or her own benefit, and he posts it on the, on the discussion. So you have to stay up to date and check whatever is being discussed, whatever is being important, because you always can miss something, or there might be something you're, you don't know. So we, we stay um, tuned for whatever is happening on the forum. It's, it's a very important source of the information and ideas. Unfortunately, in Santander, it kind of went the other way for us, because we figured out all the, the critical things early, and we were hoping for no one to post it on the, on the forum. But someone eventually did. Is there a benefit to submitting so often, like over 200 times, if you already have the data to test on? Wouldn't it just be a possibility to just test everything, just submit at the end a few times, and that's it? If you're confident with your CV, you have no benefit of submitting it to leaderboard. Actually, this is what we were doing in the in the competition, like. This month, we had like a very, very solid CV. It was perfectly correlated with leaderboard, and we had like no intention whatsoever of submitting it to the leaderboard until the last day, because well, we know exactly how it's going to be scored on leaderboard. In this case, uh, the the thing, the story behind this number is the data was quite dirty. I personally saw the same duplicated image with uh, diagnosed apparently by three different doctors. One said there is no retinopathy, and one of the two remaining ones said, oh, this is the severe case. So it was really messy, uh, and it was um, quite difficult to capture the correlation. So we submitted quite a lot just to see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, funny thing, I said we spend most of the time pre-processing data. The winner did not pre-process data at all. Absolutely, he said. I took the, the raw images and just. <laughs> Anti focused on public. Oh, yes. And he actually only focused on public leaderboard in this case, which is very rarely to work. But in this case, the, the test data was a bit different, <laughs> and we only had very small training data. <laughs> and maybe one thing to add here in this competition what, what we learned is. Um, as we saw, we had only 3,300 training images, and if you would train one of the more modern deep learning uh, models from scratch, it would fail miserably. Yeah, it would work to some degree, but it would never achieve this course. So that's why it comes really handy to just take the pre-trained models, which are usually nowadays pre-trained, meaning you train or some people train them on these large image collections, like ImageNet or whatever, which is just general types of picture of the world. Uh, or Instagram, yeah, so there are some pre-trained models on Instagram. And these models already learn some basic shapes and basic facets of the weights of the model, and then you fine-tune them on the task at hand. And this usually works really, really well, and you need way less training data for your actual task in the end. So if you do something in, 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 in the company or somewhere else, there is no way around nowadays to using these pre-trained models usually because it's, first of all, you need way less training time on your, on your actual problem and they already have so many things captured that you don't need to capture again. 
So did you guys say that you had 3,000 uh, samples in the train set and 15 in the test? And how, how is it beneficial? So where does it make sense to have such a huge test set? Um, to, I think it's for the organizer to be sure that the model works well. So they have like 15, uh, we even have it approximate on the slide because this competition, and this competition we had to submit the model. We didn't see the test data at all. We don't, we don't even know the count of the test images. We have like an approc approximation. And apparently that was the, the reason for the, for the host to like, okay, let's give them some images to fit the model, but like have a very, very proper validation. So they don't know, they don't never see the images. They don't know how many images there are, and it is relatively large sample, so like close to five times bigger than training data set. We also, uh, but like, f I was surprised to see that like three and a half Im thousand images is enough to fit a robust model, and I claim it is robust because on the private fifteen thousand it performs pretty much similar as on the public ones. Uh, but of course, we try to like do some. Uh, something to make the model uh, more robust. There was another competition on the same topic five years ago where they collected data from California and they had like 80,000 images there. We in incorporated that one. It, I think in the end it barely brought any benefit to be honest. So the pre-trained models are turned out to be really powerful. So you don't have to have too many images to fit them to your, to fine tune them to your task. That's my take on. But it can, sorry, it can be also, it, it can also be in business. Like you only have limited amount of labor data, but you want to roll it out to much more uh, uh, predictions. So that can be also really an actual thing that that happens. Yeah. So it's not completely out of the blue. So uh, does it happen often? For example, in this case, that uh, like top. I don't know, 10, 20, or maybe top uh, 100 teams decide to use the same algorithm with some uh, minor twitches, or or it's like uh, from per first to the 10 places differs a lot from algorithm to algorithm. Um, in case of like computer vision tasks, I would say they all follow the same approach. You take a pre trained model, usually take, uh, there are like few of those, I would say, which are most popular. And what makes a difference is data augmentation, and it can be created there. And like tips and tricks on how you fit the model, how what you change in the model, maybe you add some layers, maybe you remove some layers, how you train the model, maybe you, oh, there are lots of tricks, like you start training only a couple of layers, and after a couple of epochs you train a little bit more layers, and so on and so on, or you pull another data set from somewhere outside of a similar task, you pre-train few layers there, then you switch to this task and you train the whole, there's like lots of tricks. But for computer vision, my takeaway that it's usually about like tips and tricks on how, of how, on how to work with the pre-trained models. We were few that used the sufficient net, which I mentioned, which kind of came out recently compared to this competition. Um, most of the people up, they didn't use it. They said, okay, well, we do, I think they did ResNet and like variations of ResNet in the app. And yeah, also you can do in this competition that you could have done that and we did, you can do stacking of those. So you take 10 runs of rest n rest next, 10 runs of ResNet, uh, 10 runs of efficient nets, do uh, what's called TTA, augment, uh, which is augmentation of the data you predict. So you take the image of, uh, of an eye, you flip it, you rotate it, you change the color, you add some arti artifacts to the, to the image. So we have like 10 predictions from the same model. You average them, maybe you take median and so on. So those things, they, you, they pile up really quick. Uh, is it really important to have uh, to access like to lots of computational power or GPUs to be like in the first ranks or? I would say we're trying to prove that it's not the case. Uh, we, like, the first three <coughs> competitions, like, it was about either using the resources available on Kaggle or that was like a script which could have run like within half an hour. In this case, uh, you need to have a lot of GPU to do that. 
And back in the uh, back in the days, a few months ago, Kegel was providing quite a lot of GPU resources. When we started with Quora, you were able to run 10 GPU machines at the same time. Here it was seven, I think. Nowadays you can barely run one. They kind of cutting on the budget on this one. Uh, but like I, I stick to the opinion that in most cases, probably computer, computer vision uh, excluded, a good creative idea beats heavy, heavy hardware, big time. Um, we always do a few submits just to check that, so you have like a bunch of versions of the model, their cross-validation score, you submit them, you check how leaderboard behaves, you hope that it's going to be perfectly correlated, and if it does, then you can forget about leaderboard and just rely on the CD. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's nice to say that, but it might not work that well. In this case, it was really difficult, and I think the data quality is to blame. So it was like we struggled. The CD setup was quite straightforward. I mean, we have images, we do just k-fold, random, and it's fine. Uh, with the earthquake, it was basically we were not relying on leaderboard completely. We said, okay, we, we don't trust leaderboard, we trust CD. We had like three different CD schemes, and hundreds of text messages on Slack discussing which one makes more sense. So, and you could have like split it by earthquake or by like time or like mix the earthquake, stuff like this. So, uh, sometimes it takes like judgmental, arbitrary decision in the end to say, okay, this one, we're going this way, we believe in this cross validation scheme more. People tend to try to replicate the test data as much as possible. So if you have like a time series, for instance, uh, there was a fraud competition recently and they, had, they provided the data from the first half a year and the test date was end of the year, like September, October and so on. And people were ma mainly focusing on developing CV schemes in a similar manner. So you take June data, you throw away uh, April, May, and fit on the January, February, March, test on May, stuff like this. And you can try to leaderboard, sometimes it works. Uh, if it works, then good. If it doesn't work, then um, you need to convince yourself that's the way to go. Pick this model, even though it, it's lower on leaderboard, and hope for the best. That sometimes pays off big time as well. Um, you mentioned that for another competition, you dropped 20% uh, of the data. How did you decide which data to drop? That was exactly for the earthquakes for uh, Los Alamos. Uh, basically, we had the test data. It was available without labels, of course. So we saw how the, the test data looks like. We picked the most um, reliable variables and we looked at how they are distributed in train and in test. And basically, we, we came to the idea of why not trying to fit train to look like test, right? So we had, we picked some of the earthquakes from the train, which didn't look like anything from test and just dropped them. That was basically our winning idea in the end, fortunately or unfortunately. Okay, um, ending with competitions, now we're going to try to motivate you to start on Kegel. Okay, um, here I have a question to myself probably, but you can also ask this one. Um, so, uh, we told you about four competitions we <coughs> participated, and I want to mention one more which we didn't participate, which finished recently, and the data was like this. You were given atomic elements of a bunch of molecules with their coordinates of the atoms and like the letters for the atoms. And the task was to develop an algorithm that can predict magnetic, the magnetic attraction between two atoms in a molecule. That was a research physics task. And at some point, uh, 
probably everyone questions himself or herself, do I have relevant experience to like even try that? Maybe there will be a lot of physics guys who is going to beat me and I'm going to look pathetic. Um, fortunately, I know how the competition ended. I know the winning solution. So I put the question like this, did I have the relevant experience to this competition? Of course, the answer is yes. But what's the most interesting, intriguing and exciting for me is you don't know upfront which experience is going to pay off. And it's probably impossible to guess whether which of the competition was most relevant, but actually this one. Predicting toxic questions. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit because we, we couldn't use BERT, the most commonly used state-of-the-art model at the moment for NLP. But that basically was the model or variation of the model which won this physics competition. Basically, there was some uh, there was uh, a bunch of person who said, "Oh, we're dealing with coordinates. That looks <coughs> like word embeddings. Uh, let's try some attention layers to capture the interactions with, between atoms instead of interaction between words in the sentence." And they came up with a little bit modified structure, but based on NLP model and. They were, by, I think, by far the, the first team there. Uh, and all the teams, like in top 10, they actually kind of converged to that idea. Um, my, yeah, there are many takeaways from this story. First, don't be afraid to jump into the competition because you don't have experience. Second, don't think that, like, a person who did um, physics, analytics, the whole life is going to be the best in that competition. It might be some smart guy who did NLP and just for fun decided to join this competition. Because it, it, it's, it's completely different and often not the main base. Even the main expertise is, as we probably showed with this for competition, is not the most important factor. Basically, okay, I worked in a bank. I know a little bit about something there, I guess, but other three is some new area for me. Okay, motivation speech. Um, why should you start in Kaggle? Um, we do believe that in data science, doing is the proper way to learn things. Um, we all did a lot of online courses, reading books and stuff like this, but whenever you try to do things, this is the way you learn fastest. And this, this is what motivates you even more to dig in deeper into the math of what, it, what this method does or how it works. Uh, you can quickly get in touch with the data you're interested in. If you're looking for some medical research, there are usually competitions on that topic. If you're like, well, I want to do something weird, something interesting, something I've never done before, there was an NFL competition which recently ended. You could have like analyzed the data of national football players from the US moving around the pitch during the plays. Um, you keep, up, you have to keep up with the uh, with up-to-date state-of-the-art models. If there is something better than you are typically used during your work, well, you're not going to succeed on the leaderboard. You have to check, uh, you have to follow the discussion and that kind of uh, goes automatically with participating in competition. You know what's up there, what works better, what people try, what people try and fail and stuff like this. And when you compete, you know exactly what is the best for this task after you finish the competition. You know what works, you can prove that it works, you know what doesn't work, and you can prove that. You learn from the others a lot. Uh, teaming up, always a great idea. You learn how people work, you learn other ideas. Uh, probably it is as much beneficial as competing with people as well. Uh, for me personally, it is important to measure myself. Uh, if you are, uh, if you're ready to put yourself out there and do that, this is the perfect place to start. Uh, it motivates quite a lot, at least in my case, you, uh, you take the, model, the data, you're like, oh, I have a good idea, you create a model, you submit, and then you score, you, you're scored and you're 257th, that motivates you to improve. At least in my case, I'm, I'm starting to think about the ways I could have improved that, and that becomes a daily routine. 
Um, as we mentioned, hardware and software is usually not an issue, and especially with the competitions which are recently introduced, uh, where you have to use the, the cable so, uh, hardware and software uh, kernels. So you can just basically pick a starter notebook or someone else's notebook, click fork, nowadays it's called the copy and edit, and you have your environment. You can uh, code it Python or R, you have four, G four CPUs right here, or two CPUs and one GPU, you have 16 gigabyte of RAM, you have enough. Trust me, uh, for most of the tasks you have enough. And basically with one click you don't have to install anything, you can access it from anywhere, you don't need to have your hardware and so on. Uh, we participated in a lot of competitions where used fit neural networks, so, so GPUs would be nice to have, but I don't have one, I don't own one. Philip got one after we won the core competition, he got some money, so he bought a, a gaming PC finally. <laughs> How can you start? Um, uh, our advice probably would be just don't get, don't be afraid. Just try it. Just pick a competition. Maybe if you have time, uh, if you have time, just pick whatever you prefer. Uh, just go for it. Submit. Try. Read. Fork. Discuss. And regardless of where you end, you gain points. Uh, at the user ranking, you always will have more points by competing and being really bad, rather than not competing at all. There are a lot of people out there, there are a lot of people who have like no clue what exactly they're supposed to do in the beginning. There are literally 125,000 people registered there. Uh, they're getting started in competitions. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, how it looks like, how what to do, there is this uh, commonly known Titanic competition, which, which is there, uh, out there always. You have where you predict whether a person survived from the Titanic based on the data about like age, gender, which room um, he or she was occupying on Titanic, which floor, and stuff like this. So like getting started is there. Uh, but even if, even going for like a feature competition with a prize fund, you, you have nothing to lose and you don't need any like inputs, you don't need to buy hardware to do that. You just go there, register, click, work, someone else's work, and you're there. Um, other solutions and other discussions and notebooks, very important. Especially if you begin, this is very crucial. Read the past solutions, read the discussions, follow the notebooks. There's a lot of valuable stuff there. There's a lot of smart people, and even more people who want to share stuff with you, with others. Like meaningful uh, ideas, uh, very good code sometimes, uh, very good uh, uh, plots and ex data exploration, stuff like this. So you go to competition, you have like a bunch of the notebooks available for you, even some of them are scoring relatively well. If a competition starts, usually there's like in two weeks someone posting a code of a model which scores in top 50, so you can just take that and tweak it and see how it works and stuff like this. So you're never like at the bottom of the competition if you follow whatever people are posting. Discussions. Uh, it's a very typical case and it's kind of a good manner on Kaggle to post the description of your solution after the competition ended. Of course if you're somewhere in the top. Um, pretty much in every competition you can find probably 9 out of top 10 solutions. We post our solutions like the write-ups, so not code, but like description of what we did, how we did, we post it after each and every competition. Even if it's frustration for us, even if we drop from the top, we find the, the inner strength to put it, pull ourselves together and put some words together to describe what we tried. How to approach it? Yeah, choose whatever you prefer. Python or R, basically. Uh, don't be afraid if you don't know Python that well or R that well. A lot of code out there. Try, fail, the same applies to, to that. Uh, try to figure out what is the data is about, how it works, what do you need to measure, what, what's, uh, what's so special about the data. Uh, there's such, such thing as exploratory data analysis and people post a lot of code about like with plots and charts so 
Uh, I'm usually lazy to do it myself, so whenever we enter the competition, I open the notebooks, find, find ED8 and like browse through the plots. There are a lot of them. So you can learn the data even before starting start, before you started coding. Um, two ways of doing the model, you can do it from scratch. If you say, okay, I'm um, very strong in LSTMs, so I know how to do that, you do it from scratch. Or you can just pick the whatever you prefer from the published code, fork it, and start your work from there. Cross validation setup. That's something you will like learn through sweat and tears. Hopefully not. Uh, cross validation is what you have to do. You have to care about. It's important, and you will learn all the tips and tricks very quickly. Believe me. One competition is usually enough to kind of go through all the main things and see the cross validation is probably at the top always. Um, Last but not least, and I would say that's the most important um, tip for anyone who competes, experiment a lot and iterate quickly. Try a lot and fail fast. Try more and fail fast. And the last slide here with a kind of a Christmas tree. Um, I need to explain what, what, you, what you see here. Um, basically, this is our work in the last competition, NFL. Um, one dot over here is a run of one model, cross-validation basically, and you see a lot of errors, meaning that that model was the predecessor of the other one. So at this point, we started with like a basic, that was a neural network. We put together a basic neural network structure and then we started trying things. This is where we ended. So the red dot, the red dots are representing the path we made from like the baseline model to the final model we submitted. The green dots basically are all those models which, well, they didn't work. Overall, there are close to 500 points over here. Like I would say, probably 70, 80 percent were kind of useless in the end. Um, yeah, and there were another 150 models uh, which were not related to neural networks which we gave up before we started this branch. This is how it works. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of efforts, but whenever you start there, you usually have a lot of ideas. You try and you try and you try. And it's very frustrating to try a lot and nothing works but it's very, very rewarding when it works in the end. Thanks a lot. That's all for, from us. If you have any questions or any ideas or, I don't know, you want to uh, uh, contact us with regards to any projects or ideas you have, you have our contacts, uh, you have our emails, you can find us on Kaggle, I think on all the platforms, LinkedIn, we're everywhere. Um, so thanks a lot. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. of work which we did outside but most of the work was kind of tracked by the platform and after the competition uh, basically each line is a fork of one kernel from another so we just ran the Kaggle uh, API collected all the kernels we had put them together in the graph and struggled for a day to put them uh, in a nice picture to be honest uh, but like we're not that diligent with regards to uh, what we tried because like 80% and it's it's no it's okay it's normal 80 to 90% of what you try doesn't work and it probably would take too much effort to document every single thing so you run it you check the CV it's worse you forget about it or maybe some ideas are what worth following up you try it didn't work you tr or improve a little bit then you try again try again and then you give up finally 
but that was the case when we were able to automatically pick it up. That was probably the first time we, we could do that because it was just the, the uh, kernel competition. But still, we have like a huge Excel sheet where we document the models that work and where we document CV and how LB looks like and how the correlation looks like. Um, so that's definitely what we do. I think that's one thing also where we try to optimize our approach a bit because there are like some more automated tools out there that can do it. We're trying to learn about that. But until now, we haven't found a better way than having an Excel sheet where you just document everything. Yeah, we also tried some tricks, like if you have a tens of models you want to mix, we set up an S3 account and we just push everything there to store stuff like this. We try to automate whatever we can, but like with experiments it's tricky. Yeah, um, I don't know, it's probably a few hundreds, the final model, but it's it's not that you're writing a lot of code, uh, it's more like trying ideas. And with the libraries, with Python libraries, you don't have to write that much. If it's neural network, the, we do a lot of PyTorch recently, you just define the structure, and then you play around because there are like countless options of which layers you can add, remove. So, uh, and uh, if you check the, like this, the winning solutions and the scripts, okay, people don't write that good code sometimes, that's true. Um, and some like uh, computer vision solutions are very heavy, but whatever we post, we try to kind of simplify it and it's usually not that, like, not a software development sort of thing. How do you find, find time to uh, work on computation? <laughs> How do you aspire to work on team members? Um, it's actually a difficult thing to find the balance between like work, personal life, and Kaggle if you get too much into it. One of the things I can recommend is to team up some, with someone because that kind of doubles your effort. So halves the efforts you're required to do. Um, what was the second part, sorry? How do you split work? Splitting work. Uh, we, our approach is that everyone is focused on whatever he thinks is important at the moment. Uh, two reasons. First, we do that to learn. So each of us wants to learn everything from the beginning to an end. And secondly, um, an idea can actually lead you to something you didn't think in the beginning. So like. Oh, if we tweak this parameter, oh, that works. That might need, mean that something is wrong with the data. You go back to like data preparation, then you start plotting stuff and like figuring out that there's a, a funny trend, then you drop the, the variable, then you're like, oh, then probably this type of the model won't work and so on. So it's quite chaotic, uh, but if you know like the whole model from the beginning to an end, if you know the data, then it's a little bit easy to jump around. And the idea is we try to like to stick to more like general concepts and ideas whenever we try things and they're usually cross like functional. So we don't split that in one team. And many people also don't. Um, when just we two basically start, we try to start with one combined code base, basically one script or something, which does everything from start to finish. And then we can both tinker with that and both play with that. That's a bit easier. Otherwise, if you like merge with another team later on in the competition, sometimes it's harder, right? You have completely different code bases and you need to somehow combine those things. Sometimes it's just that you just combine the predictions in the end, yeah, and not the code itself, and everyone keeps working on his or her core code. But so it's not always more people in a team is easier. Yeah? So you need to find the right people and um, then the right way to split responsibilities. So you can also sp split by responsibilities, like saying, oh, you guy, you, you are now responsible for, for blending the models together. You are responsible for trying out feature engineering. You're responsible for tinkering with the model structure. So it's a lot of different ways. I don't think there is like a simple solution. If both of us are doing it, we kind of have a way of doing it already. But if other people, it's always, but it's also very valuable to learn that because you have to 
work in a team and you have to kind of arrange around different people. There seems to be some common trend of throwing a lot of resources as prob at, at problems overall, like especially in image processing mm -hmm. and neural networks. Is there anything like a measurement in Kaggle uh, about your efficiency, how, how you, you build the stuff, and how efficient you have it, or how, how quickly it runs, and that kind of stuff? I mean, it depends on the competition. Like, most of the competitions we talked about today have this kind of time limitations, actually. So if it's a kernel competition, they have like, oh, you're only allowed to use CPUs and the code only is allowed to run maximum four hours or something, yeah? Or GPU one hour, yeah? So you have sometimes in some competitions some constraints with that respect. There are, though, some image competitions out there where you can fit externally and where people with very, very heavy machines um, can, of course, have an advantage. Um, but it's, 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 it's not that common. So I think it, it kind of depends. But on those kernel competitions, yeah, there is no, like, usually no price for efficiency, yeah, but you have some constraints towards it. There's nothing like the most elegant part to the solution? Um, elegant, I mean, there are some types of competitions where it's actually not some kind of leaderboard scoring, but rather some kind of jury voting, yeah? But that's very rare, and rather is then some kind of explorative notebook or something in that direction. Um, but usually, at least, people appreciate if you do something elegantly, so, and, and it also helps yourself a lot if you think about that, because it strengthens your coding skills and, and your, your whole thought process. There's also the trick if you have a very lightweighted model which performs as good as the heavy model, then you can just take this one and build a monster around that, so it will consume the same amount of resources as your competitor, but will do better. In the more generic uh, competitions like the Santander one, can you use like proprietary, more proprietary tools like MATLAB or the Mathematic or Use um, good question. I don't know that actually. <coughs> There's a license limitation, but I yeah, I, there is there is like a whole page of license stuff and, and whatever. So probably you're not allowed to do it. Um, technically, in those competitions, it would be possible because you just upload a CSV file with the predictions in the end. Um, but probably it's not allowed. Yeah, but I, I cannot say for sure. This kind of earthquake challenge mm. if you focus on the time domain or frequency domain? Mm. Which, um, in terms of features that we used, um, in the end it was just four features and they were very uncorrelated and mostly it was about the, um, how the signal looks like, how peaky it is, how how uh, it changes, yeah. Uh, so we, we also did stuff like Fourier transformation and so on, but in the end it was rather something something rather simple, um, okay. like, like, Amplitude. exactly, exactly, yeah, um, do you remember what the exact features were? Um, yeah, there was some, uh, one of the transformations, but not for you, some other one, I'm sorry, don't remember exactly, and I think two features from that transformation, and two other one was, oh, ah, one guy liked when we called it peakiness of the signal, uh, so you take, I think, smaller time window, and you see that it fluctuates, but not about how far it goes, but rather, like you said, a threshold and how frequently it goes uh, uh, beyond the threshold, something like that. But as I said earlier in this time series data, you can think of thousands, ten thousands of different features, uh, but usually they are very correlated. So in the end, for us, it was helpful to focus on a few different types of features which are very uncorrelated, um, but both have a lot of signal to not completely distort the whole thing with a lot of correlated features. Um, usually peakiness, yeah, and, and some time window or some, some rolling window, something smaller. Yeah. Yeah. So do you usually spend a lot of time for uh, just model assembling or your idea for the model is the most important thing? Um, also depends very on the competition. Um, I think in some 
in, in we, we try to, I think we do it earlier than others are doing it. Um, so, for example, in, in uh, structural data competitions, it's sometimes more important. But with neural networks, it's rather important to fit the same model multiple times with different random seeds. That usually brings a lot because neural networks are very random. Um, you can fix the seed, but that doesn't help you much because then you're fixed to one seed. So it's rather it's rather a good idea to use different seeds and blend them together. Usually, we try to incorporate it really also in our CV setup. That we also not if you have a five fold, we don't fit one model on each fold. We rather fit let's say five models for each fold, average them so we get a more reliable CV for for. Um, for uh, blending, it's called blending mostly, yeah, which is a simple thing of an ensemble, which is just averaging multiple models. Um, I think we have never used something more than blending. Um, stacking would be the next thing, that you have another model on top of your previous models, so another model that learns how to combine the models. Um, I think usually blending is enough also, it has the benefits. Blending means just averaging a set of, of models. It has the it has the benefits that stacking also sometimes overfits very easily, and blending is usually more robust to generalize better to something else. But I think we do it earlier than others. It's 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 a very personal preference. Some others just start blending stacking in the last week or so of the competition. Um, I think we do it rather earlier usually. for this really interesting talk. Uh,